they are fascinated with fission. It's um, it's sort of almost a testosterone um, supplement. <laughs> I think it makes them feel strong and powerful because when you fish in the atom, you you actually harness the energy of the sun. The basic reason we're interested in nuclear power as an energy source is because it represents an energy density far in excess of chemical energy. E stands for energy, M for mass, and C squared is the speed of light multiplied by itself. C squared is a very great number. If multiplied by even a small mass, the result will be a very great amount of energy. Nuclear fission is a million times more energy dense than a chemical reaction. Now, you know, civilization has changed over advancements in technology a whole lot more modest than this. And this is also significant because there's really no in-between between chemical energy and nuclear energy. There's no atomic structure other than the electrons in the nucleus. It really is a change from going from chemical energies to nuclear energies, and it's a huge step. Um, they could easily put their minds to it and save the world with renewable energy. We have to get beyond burning stuff for energy. And we can either go in two directions. We can go to a dispersed form of energy, which is gathering wind and solar, or we can go to a more concentrated form of energy, which is nuclear. And the disadvantage of wind and solar that will always exist is the amount of labor, energy, and expense of gathering and concentrating and directing that energy. Because energy has to be collected and directed to do work. And nuclear energy has already been collected. We're building these all over the country, a tower, and surrounded by giant mirrors in the desert that are manipulated by computers to always shine the sunlight. You know, a half hour after the sun gets up in the morning, where we can get that turbine to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of the ones that are kind of cute and cuddly, it's energy farming. And so the density, you know, the acreage involved, you know, the watts per square meter of those things, you know, it makes it very hard. And when you do farming, you get wind, you get snow, you get, you know, your capital equipment isn't in a, a coal plant that's protected from the elements. It's, it's large and widespread. So that's very hard. But even if you get past that, there's the intermittency problem. And so if you depend on these sources, you have to have some way of getting energy during those time periods that it's not available. During the day, we generate as much electricity as we can using solar. At night, and when it's cloudy, we use more natural gas. Each year, we probably get over 200 days of sunshine, but there's 165 more days without. As big as this solar plant is, it's not enough to meet our customers' needs. The plant operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's why we need natural gas. Whether it's wind or solar, everybody is looking at gas as the supplementary fuel. The, the, the plants that we're building, the wind plants and the solar plants, are gas plants. You need to put them next to a natural gas pipe. But once we build a national grid, we don't right. have to do that because the wind in this country blows at night and the solar, everybody knows this, shines during the day. So, and those two will balance each other out, but you can't do In that theory, without, without an If we rebuild grid. the entire electrical grid in the United States. Yeah. Well, we're doing that piece by piece already. Okay. The insanity of the NIMBY thing. It, we are not running a high power line through my neighborhood. I don't get electromagnetic radiation. Yeah, Wired Magazine, they're like, to get a new trunk line to San Francisco. They like went the opposite way. And they're like, is that far enough away from people? You know, it's longer and more transmission loss. You have two week periods in the desert where you get no sun at all. Likewise, the wind doesn't blow all the time. All the types of batteries that get made for cars, for computers, for phones, for flashlights, for everything, could store less than 10 minutes of all the energy. We need a big breakthrough here, something that's going to be a uh, factor of 100 better than the approaches we have now. It's proven, like fusion was so hard to do, storing energy cheaply has been a remarkably difficult challenge for 50 to 100 years. Uh, batteries are not cheap. We can't just try to put all our eggs in, one, in the basket of wind and solar and hope for the best. Or if it doesn't pan out, it's not going to be a pretty world.
there's no free lunch. There's no free lunch. There is always a cost benefit analysis that needs to be done. Always. There's no such thing as a waste free energy source. We, we kind of go solar, it's so clean. There's protests in China over pollution from solar plants. In China's Zhejiang province in Hainan City, over 500 villagers stormed a solar panel manufacturing company, overturning vehicles and destroying offices. And that's to produce solar panels that offer 0.1% of our electricity, in contrast to 15% for nuclear. So when you go and go from 0.1% to 15%, in any technology, you're going to have all sorts of, of unintended consequences. Measurements were taken in Ireland where they were expecting a 12% reduction in CO2 from the wind farm's presence, but in reality, they only observed a 3% reduction. The reason is that the fossil fuels that had to back them up had generators that had to start and stop, and that causes more fuel to be consumed. By analogy, cars have mileages of, say, 20 miles per gallon for city driving and 30 miles per gallon for highway driving. Most positive press coverage on energy farming technologies focus on deployment, focus on generating capacity. How much carbon-free electricity was generated during the latest optimal conditions? Neither of these articles include any numbers at all about greenhouse gases. Germany only achieved a 5% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Even though Germans are generating an additional 13% of their electricity from renewables. This is partially because of inefficiencies caused by sporadically burning fossil fuel to back up intermittent renewables. But mostly because Germany is shutting down its nuclear power plants and replacing them with coal plants to meet its energy needs. And I wouldn't talk like this unless I knew there were answers. Close down all those reactors now and stop burning fossil fuel now and fill the country up with, with solar and wind and geothermal and conservation. I mean, Germany's going to be 80% renewables very soon. Germany. Soon? If the percentage of electricity generated by renewables continues to expand at the current rate, it will take just over 40 years for renewables to generate 80% of German electricity. Maybe, by 80%, Caldecott meant peak load. It doesn't matter what day German renewable peak load finally reaches 80%, any more than it matters what percentage of German electricity comes from renewables. I've just been in Germany and Austria, and lots of the little farmhouses now are covered in solar panels. Germany's moving fast. For the billions of dollars they've thrown at solar and wind, Germany is barely making a dent in their greenhouse gas emissions. My government in Australia, oh, they've done a great job. They're reducing it by 5%. I mean, that's nothing. It's neither here nor there. 5%. That's nothing. No one stays in the location because it's such a nice place. When you can't run your business, then you have to take appropriate steps. The difference of paying the renewable surcharge or not here in Germany is in the region of 400 million euros. And that's on a scale that would endanger the entire basis of our business. Um, Energiewende, the German energy turnaround, is so costly that the question of allocation of those costs um, comes to the top of the agenda. Mm. And what we have to do now is trying to reduce those costs for the future. When they get to be any meaningful percentage, that's where the problem of of their intermittency becomes overwhelming and you can actually spend way more to try and solve that problem than you spend on the, the overpriced stuff to begin with. I think people deeply underestimate what, what a huge problem that is. The economics are so, so far from being uh, appropriate. Now Bill Gates, I think, is doing some good work with his money. He's, he's setting out to immunise all the children of the world. He is taking responsibility. You can do wonderful things with money if you've got it. As I got focused on the work of my foundation and the lives of the poor, and I looked at what innovations could improve their lives, allow them to have cheaper food fertilizer, to have more building materials, uh, to have a refrigerator, to have light to read at night, I realized the very central role that energy plays in improving their livelihood. 
And so we need breakthroughs. Uh, now, if the solar guys, you know, get 10 times as cheap and solve the, the storage challenges they face and the, the transmission difficulties where the energy's not exactly where you need it, you know, that's wonderful. In fact, I, I invest some in those areas. But when you look at the numbers and you say, what could be uh, significantly cheaper than, than what we have today and located in, in every area, uh, nuclear is one of the few uh, that may be able to achieve that. They trot people like Bill Gates and out there yep. to, to, to be our friends and to sell us this stuff. Yeah, but you don't, yeah. you don't have to believe Bill Gates because he's filthy rich. Well, yeah, but a lot of people do. Yeah, but don't. <laughs> I mean, where's I your That's cynicism? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, Americans are very gullible. Americans kind of believe everything they're told. Can I get you guys to sign a petition? What for? For uh, banning dihydrogen monoxide. Oh yeah, I'll start there. Thank you very much. It causes yeah. a lot of urination. We sent one of our pals, Chris McGaha, to a rally to collect signatures for a petition. Banning dihydrogen monoxide. Oh, this is a petition for dihydrogen monoxide. What it is, is it's a chemical that is found now in reservoirs and in lakes. Water. Pesticides, different kind of companies are using this. It's styrofoam companies, nuclear, nuclear companies. And, and now when they use it in pesticides, when we're washing our fruit and things like that, it's not coming out. And she's not going to lie or even stretch the truth. Not at all. She's just going to talk about what water is and what it does with the vocabulary and tone of environmental hysteria. Which, of course, means that it's end up in the grocery stores and in our baby's food and stuff like that. It causes excessive sweating, excessive urination. We don't know if they thought, but they signed. There we are. You know, Americans are very gullible. Americans kind of believe everything they're told. The problem is rich countries can afford to overpay for things. We can overpay for medicine. We can yeah. overpay for energy. In the world where most people live, 80%, energy is going to be bought where it's economic so that they can buy cheap fertilizer and, and grow enough crops to feed themselves. Where do you put the subsidies? Do you put subsidies on R&D? Mm -hmm. Do you put the subsidies on the deployment? Mm -hmm. Today we're putting overwhelmingly 90% of the subsidies are on deployment. This is true in Europe, it's true in the United States, not on the R&D piece. And so unfortunately you get technologies that no matter how much volume you buy of them, there's no learning curve that makes it economic. Buy as much as you want, it's not going to happen. You need fundamental breakthroughs, which more come out of basic research. If you can make it economic and meet the CO2 constraint, then the skeptics say, OK, I don't care that it doesn't put out CO2. I kind of wish it did put out CO2. But I guess I'll accept it because it's cheaper right, than right, right. what's well, come before. <laughs> if you have energy cheaper than coal, we can solve that world climate and population problem because it will be in the economic self-interest of 250 nations to buy those cheaper power sources rather than burning coal. We're going to exhaust every option to deal with global warming and, until we finally get clear that actually what matters is making clean energy cheap so that we can live in a world where we mostly live in cities, we have high intensive agriculture, we've got clean energy, we've got clean water, you know, we've got recycling your materials, that's a vision of a world where we can all live modern lives, and it does not—it's uh, not—it does not require any—it uh, does not require any science fiction.